Well, we want to welcome everyone to Cornerstone Baptist Church. Those of you that are joining us online, we thank you and uh, let us know you're there. We'd like to know who we're ministering to. I invite you to take your Bibles uh, this morning and turn to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 16. And uh, we're going to be looking at a few verses in 1 Kings 16, and then we're going to be looking at one verse in 1 Kings 17. And we're beginning a new series. Uh, we've taken a break from our series in John's Gospel that's simply entitled Believe. We've had a few weeks uh, looking at a few different texts of Scripture. And this morning we're going to begin a new series that's simply entitled Elijah, Man of God. And uh, so this morning it's going to be an introductory message where we're going to kind of bring us up to speed with where Elijah comes onto the scene. And I've entitled the message this morning, Simply Meet Elijah. And so uh, looking forward to this, uh, character studies uh, are, are essential. And why are they important? What, what can we gain from character studies? The first thing is, is because the Bible is full of characters and we're to be students of the Word. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, uh, We're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so the characters, the people in the Bible are real people, and they're there for a purpose. And so God intends for us to study them and take a look at their lives in a greater measure. Also, we get a fuller understanding of who God is and what He is like when we study characters. We see His kindness and His mercy, His grace. We also see His wrath against sin, etc. And so we get a fuller understanding Scripture is all about revelation. It is God revealing Himself to us. And when we see the characters of the Bible as they stand in relation to God and as they relate to Him and God relates to them, we have a fuller understanding of who He is. Remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection? They're walking. Jesus joins Himself to them. And remember it says He began back in the Old Testament. And he declared unto them all those things concerning himself. So you've often heard the, the saying that history is, it is his story. And so we gain a fuller understanding of who God is and what he's like. Also witnessing the work of God in their lives. We see their victories, their defeats, their humanity. We can identify with them. Uh, that God is not the God, uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry, Bette Midler from a distance, okay? God is present, and He's here, and He's present in your life, and He's present in my life. And so we see their victories, defeats, their humanity. And ultimately, for our benefit and growth, Romans 15, 4 says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Why? That we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. There is something for us to learn as we study the life of Elijah and others. May God be pleased to challenge us and grow us as we consider the life of this man of God. Notice first the setting. Uh, there in 1 uh, Kings chapter 16, uh, verses 28 through 34. Now bringing this up previous to this text. Previous to this text, under Saul, David, and Solomon, there was a united kingdom. Solomon began well. But idolatry crept in as he married foreign wives. This was a very common political practice. They would forge alliances back in that day by marrying these wives. And so idolatry crept in because these wives that he would marry didn't share his faith in the God of Israel. We also know that Solomon levied heavy taxation on the people. Well, eventually his son took over and made the people's burdens even more grievous. It was at that time that the ten northern tribes broke away. The kings of the northern tribes proved to be wicked and idolatrous. There were a few exceptions when it came to the southern tribes, but when it came to the northern tribes, they were wicked and idolatrous. When Ahab, the king that is going to be confronted by Elijah, had assumed the throne, 58 years had passed since the division of the kingdom. Now notice the immediate context here in verse 28 through 34. Notice first the rise and reign characterized. Verse 28 says, So Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son reigned in his stead. 
we're familiar, if you're familiar with uh, the Samaritans in the New Testament. Remember how the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Why is that? Because the Samaritans were what they considered half-breeds. Okay, they had, they had uh, elements of true worship and of the true God, but then they had all of this influence from this paganism and idolatry to contend with. It says in verse 29, And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, try, it's giving us a timeline, began Ahab the son of Omri to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. Now notice verse 30. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Ahab's wickedness exceeded all the other kings before him. And that's saying something. Because there were very wicked predecessors to Ahab. It's important for us to note here and a very powerful lesson for us to learn. Uh, look up in verse 25 concerning his dad. It says, But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. Like father, like son, right? So here's a dad whose wickedness was exceeding, and then we come down to his son, and it says, He did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. He exceeded his dad. You know, a saying that we uh, often hear is what parents do in moderation, children will do in excess. That's very powerful for us to understand. And here it's speaking of a father. Dads, I want you to understand your influence is powerful in the lives of your children. And it cannot be do as I say, not as I do. We've got to recognize that. Uh, following Christ uh, in some circles is almost passed off as, as somehow it's, that's not what men do. That's what ladies do, that with their stockings rolled down to their ankles. They, they tug their kids to church, but certainly young, vibrant women and, and young men who are out conquering the world, certainly it's not for them. Have you read your Bibles, beloved? Have you read your Bibles? Understand, we reap what we sow. Galatians says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Where are you sowing this morning, dads? Men, what are you sowing in the lives of your children? I want you to understand, we can say all we want, but those we influence are tracking us. They're watching. They're watching how we live. They're watching the words that we speak, the actions we do. Ask yourself this. Do I want my son or daughter to be a follower of Christ like me? Think about that. It ought to challenge us. This is very powerful. We see the influence. And it's not just dads. We know the saying, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Mom, you're not off the hook either. You've got a powerful influence in the lives of your children. So we must beware and we must use our influence for the glory of God. Why? A hundred years from this date, if eternity hasn't begun, it will have begun for everybody in this room. Okay? And, you know, uh, it will. I promise you, just like the poem says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And most of what we spend our time, talents, and treasures, and anxieties upon will be for naught. You remember there's a hymn in our hymn that says, I wish I had given him more. And so, beloved, let's live so that our regrets are less. We're all going to have regrets because we're all broken. But may God be pleased to help us to live in such a way that our regrets are much less. Look at verse 31. We see his marriage to Jezebel and his passion for Baal. Verse 31 says, And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, if it had been a light thing. So, so again, this, the language is speaking to just how remarkable, that he took the wife of Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, 
and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So a little background here. So Jezebel was a famed princess of Tyre. You remember in the Gospels when Jesus says it, will, it would be more tolerable for those of Tyre and Sidon than those that had seen greater light? Because if the mighty works which had been done and you had been done in them, they would have repented long ago. So he mentions these. These, these were famous City. She was a famed princess. Daughter of Ethbaal. Ethbaal literally means Baal is alive. Now, Baal was a Canaanite deity. He was a chief god for them. They had many gods, but he was a chief one. His name means Lord, Master, Husband, Owner. You want to hear something interesting as a side note? There are places, even in our culture, where there are monuments erected to Baal. Today. Isn't that remarkable? In the U.S., and other places in Europe. He was the God of fertility in all aspects of life. In other words, humans, animals, and plants all depended upon him. So production and prosperity were linked to Baal. Each locale worshipped its own Baal. And so oftentimes it was the name of the town, and then it was, it was Baal. So, you know, it would be Baal Troy, okay? if it was Troy. The, the particular Baal uh, satanic cult that was introduced by Jezebel was Baal Melquart. And uh, she was going to have a very powerful influence on the worship that took place in Israel. Ba Baal worship consequently included incense, burnt offerings, sometimes human sacrifices. Something that seems just out of our minds to think of. People sacrificing their children. It especially included all types of sexual immorality, including sodomy. Make no mistake about it. Where you find idolatry, you find immorality. They're cousins. You know what it also tells us in the, in the New Testament? There are two things it tells us to flee. Fornication and idolatry. Very powerful things. God made us to worship. See, what we have... When somebody gets involved in addictions and things of that nature, there's a worship disorder. We've made everything clinical and we've pushed pills. Okay? Well, God's word stands. It's eternal. And God has the answers. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That doesn't mean that it's sterile. Growth and grace it can be a very messy thing, but God is the answer. Notice verses 32 and 33, Ahab was further establishing idol worship. It says, and, it says, and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Verse 33, and Ahab made a grove, made a wooden image. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings that were before him. I don't know about you, I don't want God angry with me. <laughs> you know, if, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God's against you, who can be for you? And this man had provoked the Lord God of Israel. Isn't it nice to know in Christ that any wrath that was due to you and due to me, Christ took? He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What an amazing thought. He became sin for us, like we sang in the song. And He took the wrath for us. He establishes further idolatry. Uh, Proverbs 14.34, a very famous verse says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Certainly leaders like Ahab who are pushing wickedness would be a dreadful bane on the nation. And others were going to suffer. The nation would suffer because of what these these wicked uh, people had done upon them. Notice further evidence of Ahab's disregard in verse 34. It says, And in his days did Hiel the Beth Bethlehite build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abiram his firstborn and set up the gates thereof in his young, youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Here's just further evidence. Seems a little out of place, but it's giving for us further evidence that Ahab was completely disregarding those things from before. Uh, he was allowing what was forbidden. It was forbidden by a curse and prophetic declaration back in Joshua 
uh, concerning the rebuilding of Jericho. Now, what does it mean here? And, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time and go on there. There are three things that, that are offered for what it means. He laid the foundation thereof, and Abiram his firstborn set up the gates thereof, and his youngest son Segev. There, there are three, three ideas. One is, is that God uh, slayed his children as judgment upon him doing this. Another is that he offered sacrifice, offered them a sacrifice in consecrating uh, this place. Some believe that it's just speaking of length of time, that with his firstborn he began and the gates, it wasn't completed until this time and that, that it was all full of uh, difficulties where he simply wasted his life in the building of it. Uh, but for our purposes and really what it's emphasizing is just how wicked Ahab was in idolatry and turning from the things that God had appointed to him. Notice in verse 17, so we see the setting. Now notice the man, verse 17, first verse. It says, and Elijah, Elijah's name means my God is Yahweh. It was perhaps given to him by godly parents. His name stands in opposition to the Baal worship he would confront. So those who were saying, my God is Baal, my God is Yahweh. And so as he confronts this wickedness and wicked king, it would stand in opposition. It says in Elijah the Tishbite, Tishbe was likely a town in Upper Galilee. Uh, the, the word itself is derived from a word meaning to take captive. And so it is quite possible that even, even where he was from and his origin was a warning of the eventual captivity that they were going to face. It says, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead. Now, Gilead was a rocky region. That's what, what the name means. It was a mountainous area east of Jordan that was sparsely populated. It was a place that would provide a lot of alone time with God. Uh, far from the trappings of a decadent culture, Elijah would have the opportunity to wholly focus upon God. His location sheds light upon his character formation. Uh, living in a mountainous terrain where the weather would harden and discipline the inhabitants. He was somebody that could pick up at a moment's notice and go and do God's bidding. Uh, he wasn't softened uh, by, by things that would have then been advancements uh, in the larger cities. He was a mountain man who walked with God. His past was obscure. We don't know much. He just comes on the scene. He, it was obvious he was a prophet, but his past was obscured. Now, why is that? And we see this often with other characters in the Bible. Well, because of this, it's not about us. Our study of Elijah, it's not about Elijah. It's not about Paul. It's not about Peter. It's not about John. It's all about Jesus Christ. That's who it's about. Let me encourage you, beware of getting caught up in personalities. Beware of that. If there's anyone's names who ought to be on our lips, let it be Jesus Christ and the rest of His servants. That's all we are. You remember the Corinthian church? Remember, they were rebuked for this by the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Some say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and some say, I'm of Christ. They were the spiritual ones, right? But he warned them about getting caught up in personalities. Remember John the Baptist when he came on the scene? They said, who are you? Are you that prophet that should come? He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. What was he saying? Who I am makes no difference. What I'm saying, you better listen to. Because someone's coming. The latchet of whose shoes I am unworthy to stoop down and to unloose. His environment would have been conducive to a life free from indulgence, free to wholly follow God. We must beware of the trappings of prosperity. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I have too little and steal and take your name in vain, or lest I have too much and forget my God. Be careful. Be careful becoming so entrenched in the... the the, the niceties of life, that the niceties of life become for you an end rather than a means to thank God for what He's given to you. Recognize that. Remember what it says in Genesis to Abraham? He says, I am thy shield 
and thy exceeding great reward. What's awesome about heaven? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. As we labor for Christ, what should our longing be? I'm going to labor so I have the most things in heaven, the biggest mansion. I think it was either Wednesday or last week. I said, you know the verse in Psalms that says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in tents of wickedness. I'll be fine just sitting by the door. I'm great. Jesus is there. I'll sit back there all day long. I will because he's awesome. And only he can satisfy the longing soul. We were made for that. Now, it doesn't mention here his clothing, but we don't want to uh, go on without mentioning this. Uh, in 2 Kings, Second Kings, and I'll read that for you. 2 Kings uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 7 and 8, uh, tells us his appearance, which became a, a standard uh, to other prophets. 2 Kings 1, 7 and 8 says... Uh, and fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they stood by Jordan. And Elijah wrapped... Now, I guess I'm in the wrong place here. Somebody should have corrected me. Second Kings chapter 1, verse 7, 8. And he said to them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was a hairy man and girt, about the girt, girt, about, uh, girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah, the Tishbite. It was a garment of camel's hair. He had a leather belt. You know, uh, the prophet's clothing, ironically, maybe looks like some of the runway stuff we see today. Right? It looks rather strange. I mean, I've seen some strange stuff, and I'm sure you have. I don't know of anybody that, that I know or that I see, maybe we're just in that area, that just doesn't care to be runway people. I've never seen normal people wearing what those people put out there. I just haven't. Maybe you haven't either. I'm offending some fashion designer now. <laughs> I was just going to launch my trash bag line. <clears throat> the trappings of the culture meant nothing to him. It was a sharp contrast with the Baal, uh, priest of Baal and the population. Recognize what we make much of. Dress and homes and status and fame. Everything that man clamors for is really meaningless to God. It really is. Remember James chapter 2 warning the church? He says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. In other words, let's not be prejudiced. Oh, oh hey, here comes somebody that's got money. Let's treat him great. Oh, that guy, you know, he's, he just works customer service, you know. Hey, we've got a closed circuit room for you back there. That's tantamount to what he was dealing with. Uh, in James. We've got to be careful. These things are of little consequence to God. But recognize this as we wrap up this looking at the man. God's solution was often to send a man, a man filled with the Spirit to proclaim the Word of God. Now, why is that important? Because we think, you know, hey, we've all got to get together. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. I'm not, I'm not denouncing that whatsoever. I'm saying, do you realize God can take a man dressed in funny clothes, living in a cave, bring him into a culture, and filled with the Spirit of God, with the Word of God, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, he can do what all of our efforts cannot. Why? Because he's God. And God uses the most unlikely people at times, the most unlikely means to do powerful things. Recognize this. What about today? How does this apply to us? 2 Corinthians 5.20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. Let me ask you this. This was a dark time in Israel's history. Our nation, we, none of us would sit here and argue, you know, I think we're in the, the best days yet. When I look out and see the wildfires out west, I think, what a new dawn. Nobody thinks that. We don't see the, the decay of our culture, and we're really encouraged about the holiness that's going on. No one thinks that. So what do we do? I want to encourage you, church of the living God, recognize this. As His ambassadors, I encourage you, you are and Elijah, in the sense that you bear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have people in our sphere of influence 
that God wants you and I to love them enough to speak to them because they desperately need Jesus Christ. We're his ambassadors. Notice his, notice his mission there in verse 1. Notice his mission. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, first thing we see is he confronts idolatry. That's his mission, mission specific as a prophet. What courage. He said unto Ahab, he didn't go to somebody outside the court and be like, could you relay a message to Ahab for me? Just, you know, just slip him this sheet of paper and I'm going to get out of here. He didn't say that. He goes to Ahab. What courage this took. You know, sometimes uh, we'll see, you know, uh, oftentimes you may see somebody who has the spotlight and they will make a testimony. They'll try to share their faith in their way. Uh, and what happens sometimes? Some people are encouraged and then other people are like, you know what? I don't think he was articulate enough about what he said. And what's amazing is only 2% of every 2% of all Christians regularly share their faith. Isn't that amazing? Now, I'm with you. We, we need, Paul says, pray for boldness for me. We need boldness. Are you going to have all the answers? No. You know why? Because you're not God, and neither am I. We don't have to have all the, all, all the answers. Were you blind and now you see? Tell someone. Share it with somebody. He confronts idolatry. He had courage. Obedience to God often takes courage. It really does. And I hope you're courageous enough to obey God even when others are not. Even when it's difficult. You know, I feel like doing this, and to do this may cost me some friends. It may. To do this may cost me a lot. Your atonement costs Christ His life. Have courage, beloved. He confronted idolatry. Notice he speaks for God. He says, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, so he's representing God. Remember the difference between a prophet and a priest. A prophet represented God to man. A priest represented man to God. And so he speaks for God. Notice he says, before whom I stand. Before, his reality was his reality before God. That's all of our reality. We don't think about that. You're driving to work Monday morning. Maybe God's not in your thoughts. You're not thinking about, you know, within 15 minutes I could meet Him. Monday morning, tomorrow morning, there's going to be all around our country people that left for work and they never come home. They're going to meet King Jesus within 15 minutes of their commute. Think about that. We don't know. But the God before whom I stand, His reality, His kingdom, His purposes, His presence... Notice he says, there shall be no dew nor rain these years, but according to my word, God had warned them. And this drought that lasted, we're told in James 5, 17, lasted three years and six months. In doing this, Elijah was demonstrating God's power over the rain, not Baal's. Remember what we said Baal was? Baal was the God of fertility, you know. He was the God of prosperity. The plants, the crops depended on him. And so here steps a prophet. And he steps in, this mountain man of God, he comes, rough as he was, and he says, it's not going to rain. It's not coming. Why? Because God, and not Baal, or whoever else we want to add in that place, is in charge of things. What are some life points? What are some life points? And whenever you do an introductory to a series of this nature, they're... A lot, I know there's a lot of information. There's so much good information out there available, but you want to fill in and bring us up to snuff. But what are some life points? We didn't cover a lot of text this morning. What are some life points this morning? Number one, God will judge sin. God will judge sin. We cannot get away with it. Recognize this. There's never been a sin committed in God's universe that won't require payment. Think about it. The sinner dies without Christ. Where are they going to go? They're going to go, the wages of sin is death, and they'll go their way. So it's either you paying for your sins or your substitute paying for your sins, that being Christ. It's one or the other. 
No one gets away with anything. People think they do. Oh, you know, he got away with this. No, he didn't. We hope he repents, because trust me, the judgment bar to God is far greater than any Supreme Court we have in our land. Trust me. They don't want to face God. Let me encourage you as a believer, if you're here and you don't know Christ, recognize this, don't put it off. If you don't have 100% certainty this morning, if you die today, that you would be with Jesus Christ in heaven, let today be the day that you trust Christ and you do so while you have breath. Trust Him today. You may not get a second chance. The Bible says today, if you hear His voice, harden not your hearts. For God's people, let me encourage you, keep short accounts. Keep short accounts with God. Don't stray from God and then look back three weeks later and be like, man, I've really strayed from God. Don't do that. Keep short accounts. When, when you sin, confess and forsake and march on. The lifestyle of a believer is repentance. I, I messed up. I turn. I believe and obey. Repent, believe and obey. That's the lifestyle of every believer. I turn from sin. I'm trusting Christ and His promises, and now I'm going to obey them. Keep short accounts. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when they violated the Lord's Supper? You remember what he said? It says, because they did this, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. They had done so atrociously that God had to bring some home in judgment and in chastisement rather. But it says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we're judged of the Lord, we're chastened that we would not be condemned with the world. So in other words, if you're here today as God's child, here's the great news. God's not going to let you continue in a pattern of disobedience. He loves you too much for that. Moms and dads here, we love our children too much to let them go. Mom and dad, I'll see you. I'm going to drive into the brick wall right down here, okay? We stop them. And God loves you far greater than we love our children. And He's not going to let you continue. Be like Moses. Have a long view have a long view. What do I mean by that? Back here in, in Hebrews chapter 11, I want to read this for you. Uh, not take up too long, but Hebrews chapter 11. I want, want, you, want you to be encouraged to have a long view of life, of eternity. And if you get this, you, you get much. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, it says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. See, we have choices. All of us have choices. Why? He says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So he said, I will choose reproach and not temporal happiness, not temporal position and fame. I'm going to choose Christ. Verse 27, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he, is in, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Remember, endure when there is every external reason not to endure. Keep your eyes on Christ. Have a long view of your life. God will judge sin. Secondly, God is faithful and always provides light and darkness. He's faithful. This was a dark time in Israel's history, and he provided light via Elijah. And then afterwards, Elisha. And that's, that's really just, just an amazing study. I'm so looking forward to getting into these dynamics here. But he always provides light. Remember Jesus said, John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. You know, he also said in Matthew uh, chapter uh, 5 that you and me as the church are the light of the world. He's a source light. We reflect his light. Let's quit complaining, beloved, and get busy with our mission. It's easy to look around, look, all, the, all this is happening, that's happening. What's going on over here? What's, it's so easy to do that. Let's quit complaining. God has not called us to leave the plow and figure everything out. He's called us to put our hands to the plow and do what He has clearly revealed to us through His Word. Just keep our hands to the plow. Just keep walking. Just keep marching. Number three. This ought to be encouraging. We don't have to fit into anyone's mold. We are to be conformed to Christ. It's amazing. You know, you hear people use things like, oh, that person's weird or that person's that. Look, as humans, broken people, we're all weird on some level. We all have things that we do that's like, what do you do that for? Okay, but you know what's nice? 
God doesn't call us, we're marching to Zion church. He doesn't call us to fit into somebody else's mold. He wants you and me to be conformed to Jesus Christ in all of your uniqueness. How awesome is that? I don't have to be that guy. I remember in school one time, we were in some class, and, and uh, the president of the school was known to wear Argyle socks. Okay, well, I mean, I didn't pay, I, you know, but you're like, well, we know this, Pastor. I never paid much. Attention. I got shirts that are older than my children. And they're like, Dad, you still got that shirt. Yep, you know, it hasn't wore out, you know. But this, this young fella, he looked, and he said, he said, hey, guys, look, I got Argyle socks like Dr. So-and-so. Wow. Well, that's something to pat yourself on the back for, right? We don't got to fit anybody's mold. You don't need Argyle socks. You don't need to wear that guy's kind of shoes or that lady's butt. You don't got to do any of that stuff. Just look at Jesus and let him change you and watch what he does. And then lastly, lastly, God can and will use you be passionate for God. In James 5.17, James, this pastor, knows just how important this man Elijah was to the history of Israel. So he gives the example of this drought and this judgment. And he says, Elijah was a man of light passions like us. And he prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain. And then he prayed that it would rain. So, James 5, 17, what's he telling us? Elijah's just like you, and he's just like me. He has the same struggles, same heart that is deceitful above all things and desperate. He has those exact same things. God will use your experiences. I don't know what has shaped you. Sometimes we look at our past, we're like, oh, my past is so horrible, there was nothing good. Yet God uses your past uses your experience, your backgrounds, your strengths, your weaknesses, and He'll use them for His glory. Let me just say this to second, third, fourth generation Christians. Being someone who came to Christ at 19, no one else in my family was saved. I came back and everybody thought I was crazy. I wanted to know about Jesus. Uh, well, it was kind of one of those things like, well, you know, He's got Jesus, you know. He'll get over that. Like I was riding the Jesus horse, and I'd jump on another one down the line. Never happened. Why? Because he captured my heart. I want to encourage you. If you're here a second, third, fourth generation Christian, let me encourage you. I hope you take personally the precepts of God's Word. I hope you don't sit, as it, as it were, in the shadow of mom and dad. Well, this is mom and dad's faith. I kind of go to church for mom and dad and for this. It's kind of what's expected. If that's your faith in Christ, you got to make some changes. Because I want you to know, if you are here and you've known Christ as a little child, and you're like, I've always known this. Well, let me encourage you. You may have always known this, but maybe you've truly not known the God of Israel and the living God and what He wants to do through you. Elijah was once a toddler, okay? He was once a teenager. And you second-generation Christians who have so much you're accountable for, get off the sidelines and do something. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all the earth to show Himself mighty in behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to Him. Let me encourage you. Why don't you say, God, today, I don't know what you want me to do, but, but I'm yours. You went to a cross for me. You died for me. I will live for you. Why don't you lay it all down? Whatever it is, whether it's a sin, a habit, whatever keeps you from being all that God wants you to be so He can use you. And I promise you this, whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for Jesus' sake will find it. Why don't you find what true life is today and lay it all down before the King? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you this morning for your word and 
God, we come together this morning as your people broken with, with all, of our, all of our weaknesses, our frailties. I, I know that I, I feel it. I know that, that everyone here, everyone to whom we would minister, we are broken. We don't measure up, but the gospel's not about our measuring up. It's about you and how Christ measured up for us. I pray that that thought, of all that Jesus is for us, all that He has done for us, and all that that means would permeate our hearts and minds like never before. And God, in an ever-increasing darkened world, I pray that You would help us to understand that it's not about us. It's about You. And You can use us in all of our brokenness, all of our weakness, all of our failures if we will but yield ourselves to you. Give us courage, God. Fill us with your Spirit. And use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank uh, everyone for tuning in at home. Uh, if we can bless you in any way, if you'd like to contribute to the ministries of Cornerstone as we seek to get the gospel out in our local area. We encourage you to do so online. May God bless you. Remember, God loves you and this pastor loves you. Have a wonderful week. Let's stand together, beloved. And as a music.